This is CSS in just five minutes. I'll explain CSS how I understand it and the parts of it that I use the most as a full stack developer. You can write CSS directly in HTML like this or this, but it's best to use a CSS file. CSS just has two easy pieces, selectors and attributes. Selectors say, hey, search my HTML for elements that match this. You can select by element, like h1, classes with a dot, an ID with a hash, or chain multiple together. Chaining with a comma just means select this and this. The space syntax means inside of. The caret selects one level deep. That is headers just one level deep inside that class. Keeping your selectors as simple as possible, like a single class name, are the best case scenario. Once you've got things selected, you need to add some attributes. Now attributes are the actual styles we apply, and these styles get applied from the top to the bottom of your CSS file. Now it's not quite that simple because what if we have two conflicting styles? Well to resolve that there's something called specificity. More specific selectors get priority, so it goes from ID down to class down to broad elements. When you chain selectors together it gets really complicated, but you'll get a feel for this over time. There are two really big categories, color and layout, and then a ton of different random properties. Two common things we set color on are backgrounds and text. We use the background hyphen color and color keys, respectively, and then fill in attribute values like red, cornflower blue, or sky blue. These color words are easy to read but limited, so more often you'll use a hex code. You can find colors you like around the internet and then get the hex with a color picker extension. Now for layout attributes, which is all based on the box model. Everything is a box inside of a box. Each box is made up of content, padding, border, and margin. I'll set some values for these and then explain them. We can see the box model over in Chrome on any page, which allows us to check the values and debug if things are being weird. The blue part is content, which we set in CSS as width and height. Width and height are best to set as percentages of the parent container. Otherwise, everything gets messed up and can go out of bounds. You can position things within this blue content box with text align center left or right. The padding attribute can throw people off because you can write either one, two, or four values. That's because you can set top, right, bottom, and left individually, or top and bottom, left and right, or all four sides. If you're writing four, remember it by going clockwise. First top, then right, bottom, left. You can also set a side individually like so. Margin top, padding left, you get it. It's important to know that your element's background color will get applied to padding, but not border or margin. We've set this padding with pixel values, but you can also make it rem or rem. Rem is relative to the base font size, so if you change the base font size, it will change the spacing of everything. This can be useful for responsive designs. Next up, border, which is the border between padding and margin, and has a three-part syntax, size, type, and color. 99% of the time, you're just going to be using solid for the type, and the color rules work the same as for other stuff. Finally, margin, which is on the outside of our box, and works exactly the same as padding with the 1-4 to four value syntax. Our background color will not extend into the margin. Okay, that's the box model. Next up, the display property. Use inline for a continuous line and block to space things out, or inline block if you still want the benefits of both, being able to set the top and bottom padding, but still have the same line. Display flex and grid deserve entire videos of their own. You can specify an exact grid, which is great for building based on a design or UX wireframe. For general purpose and spacing as you go, display flex is amazing and it's my go-to. It's easy to center horizontally and vertically with the align items and justify content properties. You can put things in custom places too by setting position relative on the parent and absolute on the child. Then we set the top left, bottom, and right values, which can also be percentages. Now back to selectors for a minute. We also have pseudo classes, which you can add with a colon. Most common is probably hover, which works a bit like this. A different set of styles for when your mouse is over the element. And to make it a smooth transition, we can add the transition property, which takes the time and a Bezier curve value. We can also make this button move on hover with the extremely cool transform property. There are other pseudo classes that allow you to select an element, kind of like we were doing with the space and caret. A couple examples are first child and nth child, but again, keep it simpler than this whenever you can. We didn't cover font family or font size, but these are pretty self-explanatory. You'll always see more than one font for font family, just in case the first one doesn't work. We did cover background color, but you can also set a ton more background properties like background image, and you can use the shorthand background syntax to put these all in one line. 
Other cool attributes include shadows like box shadow and drop shadow, and I usually use a box shadow or drop shadow generator for this. You can play around with the options and then just copy the CSS here. Just Google box shadow generator to find this. By the way, you'll notice these things called vendor prefixes in front of the box shadow property. These are used for new or experimental attributes that get added to CSS. At this point, box shadow is not new at all though, so it's just for backwards compatibility with older browsers. My rule of thumb is to use them if they're included in the documentation for that attribute, but otherwise just leave them out. You can create animations with keyframe and the animation property, and it's usually better to just Google CSS animation and then whatever you want, and you'll be able to find one pretty easily. Just like background, animation has a shorthand property too. Lastly, we have media queries, which allow us to style for mobile in different screen sizes. These are triggered by breakpoints, which are kind of like if statements. So if the width is wider than a certain amount of pixels, then the style gets applied. And you can use your browser developer tools to test this out. Okay, what else is there with CSS? Well, you have preprocessors. The common one is SCSS or SAS, which gives you more syntax, variables, nested properties, but it doesn't do anything normal CSS can't. Finally, in frameworks like React, you will see CSS in JavaScript, which is also called a styled component pattern. And the line between JavaScript, CSS, and HTML really gets blurred here. Don't worry too much about these styled components are very similar to regular CSS and get converted to CSS at compile time. Whether you're already a CSS pro or you're just an aspiring front-end developer, I hope this was a helpful summary of CSS. Like if you learned something, and if you want to become a remote software developer, subscribe for more content like this.